so we're starting out with polynias. Um, our work was looking at these sensible heat polynias around Antarctica and trying to understand what we can get from ISAT2 and um, by combining it with other data sets, understand ice ocean interactions happening there. Um, so I'm Tasha Snow. And I'm Meng Lan Zhao. I'm Maria Lozano. We got <laughs> Louis Bachelot. I'm Anne-Sophie Singh. I'm Wilson Sata. Yeah, and that's our team. Um, so we had a lot of fun doing this, and um, I'll walk you through, kind of start walking you through what we did. So next slide, Wilson. So just as a quick review, Antarctic um, polynias, persistent polynias stem from warm, deep water coming into towards the ice shelf, melting it, which is um, the melt is relatively buoyant that rises to the surface and can bring warm water up with it. And if there's sea ice right at the edge of the ice shelf where that plume of water melt comes out, then um, that warm water can, can melt a hole in the sea ice and create a circular feature called a persistent polynia that is there seasonally and in multiple years in a row. And so we're really interested in this area because it um, can tell us potentially about basal melting happening beneath the ice shelf, may it impact um, ice shelf stability, and there's lots of ice ocean interactions happening there. Next slide. So the goals for our work, um, what we kind of went through was to first find the polynias around Antarctica that had ice set two tracks ac across it, do some data discovery to figure out what products would be most useful for ice set two because this is a marginal zone along the coast where glacier, ocean, and sea ice all meet. And there's lots of different products for each of these, and we weren't sure which ones would be best. Um, then we read in all the ATLO3 tracks and cycles into X-ray and PANDAS data frames in a way that was usable for our team and intuitive. We did some 3D visualization, processed the ocean surface, um, did some surface type classification and comparisons to different data sets, including ERA-5 reanalysis and some, some basal melt rates. So the data that we used was ISAT-2, ice ocean profiles, basal melt rates from David Sheen, Landsat-8 visible and thermal imagery, and ERA-5 reanalysis data. Next. I'll yes. turn over to Anne Sophie. Thank you, Tasha. So the first thing that we had to do was to find out what the uh, polynias would be good to look at. So on the left, we see a map where all of the red and the black dots represent persistent polynias. Um, and then what we did was that we used open altimetry to try to figure out what polynias would have repeat tracks from ice set two, and preferably also without too much cloud cover. And we came to uh, three polynias, one on back ice shelf, one on Pine Island, and one on Salzburger. Um, yes, and they all had uh, a number of different tracks uh, going over. And for now, we will focus just on uh, Back and Pine Island. Next slide, please. So here we see the polynia on the Back Ice Shelf. Um, in the background, we have a Sentinel-2 image from approximately the same time as the given ISA-2 track. And this was um, used, or this, this figure was made using Google Earth Engine. Um, and what we can then see is the cross section of the uh, ATLO3 and ATLO6 product to the left. And we can clearly see the polynia here. And we can also, in one of the cases, we can also see some clouds or at least something else is being tracked. Next slide, please. And here we have uh, an example from uh, Pine Island. Um, and again, we can see we have Sentinel-2 image from roughly the same time as the ISA-2 track. And we can see the different tracks and the different cross sections. In some of them, we do see some sea ice, which there's also a zoom in up and we can see both the sea ice, but also the polynia itself. Um, yeah, and then for one of the cases, at least the Sentinel-2 image is, uh, is uh, full of clouds. And it would be nice for further studies to to be able to plot the um, the elevation of uh, ISA2 on top of the Sentinel-2 um, image using Google Earth Engine. 
Next slide, please. Here we have a look at how uh, the basal melt rate of Pine Island uh, Glacier looks like um, compared to this Polynya. And this is uh, high resolution basal melt rates from David Sheen. And we can really see that there are extremely high basal melt rates just where the Polynya is located, which is really cool. And also, um, yeah, it tells you something about how this Polynya has been formed or at least how it's uh, being sourced. So that's really cool to see. Yeah, next slide, please. I will pass it on now. Great. Um, and then from there, from that initial data exploration using Open Altimetry and Google Earth Engine, we looked at the different available data products to explore what might be best for future analysis. So as Tasha mentioned, we really needed a data product that could capture all the surface types that we were looking at, ocean, sea ice, sea ice leads. And we just found that the higher level data products had fewer granules available at these three regions of interest, the three polynias. So we ended up selecting ATO3 just because it had the maximum granule availability. And then from there, um, the, what I what I worked on was reading ISAT2 into a pandas data frame using H5, H, HPI5. And um, there's a lot of a lot of people have done this. There's a lot of code for that out there. Uh, but I wanted to try it for myself and, and see what was going on um, under the hood. So I just downloaded using ice picks, HPI5 beam by beam, uh, filtering on the photon signal confidence and storing beams as individual data frames and then concatenating those. And then for future, just advancing this, I like to download multiple granules from ice picks using different dates versus a date range uh, to look at the open polynias that we see in optical animetry and read through all the granules of interest, also using a for loop just to increase efficiency. Um, and then I also looked at reading into ISAT2 using a, into Panda's data frame using Dask. And this is a, thanks to Wei Ji. Um, he was one of our tutorial leads and posted this uh, code on the help channel. And it was really amazing to be able to read so many um, photons. You can see how many roads here, this multiple, uh, granules concatenated, um, and then lots of data variables of interest that we could analyze from there. And then from there, this is just some 3D plotting of the Bach ice shelf plenia. Um, and then from there, we we also looked into pulling data into a X-ray data set. So I'll hand it over to Louis to talk about that. Thanks, Wilson. So similar to, to, to Wilson, I tried to make the data more user friendly by loading in, into an X-ray data set. So it sounds very simple at first because we just have to read the ground track by ground track, adding a ground track ID and concatenating it all together. But um, I faced the problem with the data time index that has duplicated value and concatenation is therefore impossible. Thankfully, in our use case, we don't need the exact time of each photon. So I could just switch that index to a, a simple counter. And the concatenation was therefore possible. Um, I have to mention that this function is extremely slow. So if people want to work on making it faster in the future, that would be great. Um, the resulting data set is what you can see on the bottom left part. Uh, so it's indexed by ID points, which is the index I just created above the ground track ID and the DS surface type. And it makes it easy for us to just select one track and plot it or plot the three tracks together, as you can see in the next slide. Yeah, here's a 3D plot of the data over Pine Island. I just did a simple fil simple filtering over the, the quality and the signal confidence to have a quick view of what it looks like. Uh, but Natasha will present you what we did further with this. Unmute. Um, so from there, we wanted to find the um, ocean surface, especially. Um, and with ATLO3, we wanted to be able to treat these surfaces differently. So what most of what I did was to be able to classify um, these photons as either ice or ocean so that um, Magnon, who we'll talk to you in just a second, could um, retrieve the surface using ATLO3, especially of the ocean. And so on the left, I'm using uh, Landsat 8 to do that. Uh, 
I'm just showing an ice classification and an ocean classification, which will be integrated with um, Magnon's work. And then I also did some work with um, Landsat 8 Thermal to retrieve the ocean temperature and ice temperature um, over the Polynia area to also compare to the height, um, which Magnon will also show in a moment. This is from summertime, so next slide. This is a, just an example from wintertime. So you have like no visible imagery. Um, you have sea ice constantly forming at the surface, even when the Polynia is opening. So um, that's kind of the difference between the two. So Magnon. Yeah, thanks. And uh, we're interested in extracting some detailed sea surface height signatures inside of uh, Polynia. And plots here are built on the code from my teammates. And with some experiment, we decided to estimate the height using histogram of every 70 photons along the track. An example is shown on the left. And the height uh, with largest data concentration is considered as the sea surface height estimate, and their uncertainties are characterized by standard errors. And on the right, uh, we're showing the height estimate along a track across a polynia. And black line is the height estimate, and the gray indicating uncertainties. And colored lines here are photon den densities. So um, as we can see, over the ocean area, photon density is relatively low compared to the ice regions. And next, please. So using the method of above, here we're showing the height estimates across all beams. And on the left is a bird view, and on the right is a 3D version. Uh, the color schemes are zoomed in to focus on the variability of sea surface height. Um, next, please. And then next, uh, we want to compare our height estimate with the thermal data. And uh, we're showing the, this comparison in the same polynia in both summer and the winter. And right line here is from the thermal data and the gray and black lines are height estimates. And we find in both seasons, um, temperatures are higher than their surroundings over polynia uh, as expected. And over summer, um, the height data are relatively in coarse resolution than winter. And this is because the density over open ocean, uh, the photon density over open ocean are relatively low. But over the winter, um, the polynia is filled with ice and ocean mixture, and this would increase the photon, photon density. And another thing to notice is the increasing height uh, in winter from south to north. And this reflects the wind uh, is blowing in that direction so that the um, sea surface height is piled up there. So uh, in the future, we'll try to integrate the surface classification with um, our sea surface height estimate and also try to improve our methods to a better estimate. And next, please. And so the last thing that we wanted to do was sort of just try to start and understand what sort of physical processes might be driving uh, the creation of these polynias, um, just trying to better quantify the mechanical and the thermal different uh, components. And so to do that, we uh, tried to look at ERA-5 reanalysis data set uh, data. And so what we see here is plots for the mean sea level pressure and then 10 meter winds. The red boxes just, uh, they represent the area over which the polynia actually is. We took a bit of a bigger region just to get a better understanding of what's going on um, sort of in a larger region. And so as we can see, uh, these pressure gradients and the corresponding winds sort of show us that we have this uh, wind motion that we can sort of uh, interpret as being as contributing to the formation of this polynia, being the mechanical uh, forcing of the polynia um, in addition to whatever thermal, uh, <clears throat> thermal contributions there may be. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, and those plots were for Pine Island um, and the date is, uh, I guess, the April 15th. Um, here, on the other hand, we have uh, some thermal variables, so some heat fluxes. Um, we have uh, mean surface latent heat, mean surface sensible heat, and then the net mean surface uh, heat flux. And so here we can see that there aren't necessarily any discernible 
you know, features that might help us understand what is going on um, within the pollinia. Um, I don't think, obviously these, these figures are a little bit harder to interpret, but um, just from looking at them superficially, it doesn't really seem like we're capturing anything really interesting, which maybe, you know, makes us realize that while era five data, for instance, might be able to help us understand the mechanical forcing of pollinias, it doesn't do su such a good job when it comes to any sort of uh, thermal sort of interactions happening. Uh, next slide, slide please. And so, uh, you know, this asks the question of, this makes us ask the question of whether we can use lots of different data sources to help us understand um, pollinias. And so era five or reanalysis data sets might be a good option for helping us understand the uh, mechanical behavior of pollinias um, in time. And so this is just a time series for the daily and then averaged weekly and monthly uh, behavior of the mean sea level pressure um, in time. And next slide, please. And so then finally, it's just that sort of on the same vein that, you know, we can reconcile eyesight to data with, for example, the Landsat uh, data that we saw as well and the basal melt rates that we also saw along with reanalysis data to try and build a, uh, a better picture of what's actually, actually happening. Um, and yeah, and so this figure was a work in progress of trying to reconcile, uh, you know, the ATL06 uh, data along with the um, mean sea level pressure, but this was a work in progress. And I think that's it. Thank you.